My name is Ernie Ram. Uh, I'm an archaeologist with the uh, Bureau of Reclamation. Uh, Animus La Plata project, uh, it was a uh, Indian water right settlement with uh, Ute Mountain Ute and Southern Ute and Reclamation was responsible uh, for overseeing and constructing this project. So after the excavation work was completed on the sites out here, the reservoir started getting filled. I, took a few years to fill and basically ever since then the area has been closed to the public because it's a very lengthy process reclamation has had to go through to make plans and do environmental assessments of you know how the area is going to be managed um, for a while we were looking for another entity to help manage recreation in the area and the city of Durango stepped up and so the current plan is to, the city of Durango is going to annex areas on the east side of the lake and then a buffer around the lake that they will be able to have there in law enforcement uh, out here monitoring activities. And the current plan is to keep the rest of the area closed to the public. There was a, uh, a lot of uh, cultural resource compliance work uh, that was done for a project this size. We needed to come in, um, uh, worked with the uh, Ute Mountain Tribe uh, to have this whole area surveyed and then uh, the sites that would be under the high water mark uh, were actually excavated uh, to collect all that data. The archaeological work that has been done in the basin now is, uh, you know, over 10 years old. So in archaeological terms or in cultural resource management terms, that's old so I've been working on completing those surveys and then we'll be consulting with all of our consulting parties which are uh, 23 tribes. We also consult with the National Park Service now. Our focus now is to uh, open this up for recreation and also protect the sites that uh, are above the high water mark. Talking about why we even know so much about Sacred Ridge and how much we know about Durango archaeology. And so the mechanism um, for the archaeological project that coincided with the construction of Lake Nighthorse um, was funded by uh, federal dollars. Um, and that's all due to legislation, um, the National Historic Preservation Act and Section 106 of that act that mandates having to do archaeological investigations to um, offset the effects of any project, um, such as a reservoir. The Animus La Plata project uh, that uh, was preceding the construction of Lake Nighthorse uh, was one of the largest uh, archaeological projects uh, ever conducted in the Four Corners. And that's directly due to those federal laws that are right now or again um, threatened by uh, current administration wanting to repeal that type of uh, environmental protection, the cultural environment in this case. Part of the Animus La Plata project, uh, the investigation included 74 archaeological sites in and around Ridge's Basin. Sacred Ridge, which was named by the Reverend Homer Root in the 1960s, was one of those sites. and. Prior to the project, we understood that it was one of the largest um, archaeological sites in terms of size. It covered almost uh, 13 acres in extent, so we understood it was a, a large site. The details and significance of the site only came to light after four years of uh, excavations at the site. Through the, all of the excavations we did, we, we really found evidence that it culminated in um, a violent, uh, widespread violence and the entire community fell apart and people migrated out. And while there's evidence of violence throughout prehistory, this was more extreme and more punctuated, dating to that 800s, early 800s time period. And talking about Chaco and the um, later periods, we're, we're at a period here in the uh, 700s and early 800s where villages are really a new thing. People living together in villages 
is almost unprecedented in the northern southwest. And Basket Maker 3, which is 500 to 700 or so in, in Chaco Canyon, the whole canyon was the site. And from one end to the other, it's about nine miles long of great big basket maker sites at either, I mean huge basket maker sites at either end and just continuous basket maker in between them. So it isn't a spot that's moving, it's a sort of length that's moving, which corresponds fairly well to the length between one end of Bridges Basin and the great big P1 sites, the 700 to 900 sites down in Blue Mesa, which is on the Animus. But this whole valley here is almost like you move Chaco north. So at Sacred Ridge, the, the, the final abandonment of Sacred Ridge is punctuated by violence. It looks like uh, the majority of the site occupants um, perished during that violent event. But if we um, look at the number of households that were present, it could be that that represented about half of the site, that not every single uh, resident was dispatched. The momentary population of Sacred Ridge is probably closer to 100 individuals, and the number that perished in the final event was 40 or 50 individuals. One of the most interesting findings from the Animus La Plata project was addressing the question of um, what happened after the Pueblo I period. Prior to the project, we assumed that with thorough enough investigations and extensive excavations, we would find other archaeological components in, in Ridges Basin. And instead, what we found was very abruptly, around AD uh, 825, the area is abandoned. We don't see later components, um, later uh, occupations of the basin, aside from um, temporary uh, moves through the basin. I think a lot of the abandonment of Ridges Basin by ancestral Puebloan people has to do with that deep memory of time, that the memory of the events that happened, the catastrophic abandonment of the area, had to do with the fact that um, there was stories of, there was memory of these events that might have happened 500 years, 800 years prior to when they're retold and retold again. My understanding of, of Ridges Basin and Blue Mesa, because I think they're all part of one aggregation, is that there's very little here immediately before Pueblo I, which is the time period this really happens, from 700 to 900. There's very little um, before that. There's almost nothing after that. It's not that, you know, totally, it's totally absent of folks, but it, uh, not, it's like something happens in 700 to 900 where a whole lot of people come in here and last for several generations, and then there's nobody after that. Um, that's actually a pattern that shows up in some other places that Chaco deals with, uh, like Chimney Rock, where you know there's nobody there, then there's a whole lot of people there, and then there's nobody there thereafter. Um, it's a pattern in the Four Corners in that after 1300, there's nobody home. Everybody leaves, which is, this is not usual in human history for all these, you know, that many people, 30, 40,000 people, to all leave. They didn't have to all leave. And I think that speaks to the issue of time um, being really different from how we conceive it in the modern world is that events that may have happened a thousand years ago are as real as events that are happening right now and events that may happen a hundred years from now are discussed with the same kind of reality as uh, events that are happening in the present. The final abandonment of Ridges Basin I think um, is a testimony to that depth of time the area around Ridges Basin being reoccupied, but Ridges Basin being very selectively excluded from reoccupation has to do with events and, and areas being, um, having that memory that it's not a good place, it's not something we want to revisit, we don't want to go back there. Um, but it certainly seems to be a, 
an archaeological signature of again I would think it's we could we could interpret it as political you know uh, political movements political rises and falls I think that's part of what we're seeing here is that areas are abandoned abandoned is the wrong word but areas are, are left and not reoccupied because they're not supposed to be reoccupied when you talk to some Pueblo people uh, they'll, they'll talk about um, Chaco as a place where things happened that weren't right for Pueblo people. You know, it was a wonderful place, amazing place. It's, it's part of their history, it's their ancestral place. But what happened there isn't necessarily what they're doing today. And they don't want to go back to that. And a lot of history is written on the ground in the Southwest. So you don't go back to that. You, know, you reinvent yourself someplace else and you know, become a Pueblo in the Rio Grande. And spending millions of dollars doing the archeology span uh, is how we even further bolster that idea is that all the data points in that direction is that how do we prove people have this concept of time that goes back hundreds and thousands of years you can talk to modern Pueblo people and they'll tell you that but you can also look at the data and say well this doesn't seem to be anything particularly new this is in the minds of the prehistoric people as well they knew of these things and in terms of space that the geography that prehistoric people dealt with as their reality is much larger than we give them credit for. They knew the world beyond Ridges Basin, they knew the world beyond the modern boundaries of the United States and Mexico, all of these things were known to them. And so they may have never seen a macaw, for example, yet there's a macaw or a parrot effigy here in the Pueblo I period. The connections between the Southwest and Mesoamerica are of great interest to the Native American people and you know, everybody else. It, in a way, it's almost misframed because we think about our Southwest and Mexico, and there was no border a thousand years ago. <laughs> and it's all part of one big civilization. This is the northern boonie. We're, we're standing at the northern edge of Mesoamerica, you know, really diluted and thinned out, but this is it. Um, there are always comings and goings, and, and even by large groups of people. I, I'm very confident of that at this point. There's an archaeologist uh, named Ben Nelson, who's at Arizona State University, who has worked both in Mesoamerica and in the Southwest, who um, n proposed quite some time ago that with the fall of Teotihuacan, which was the, the big, big city, the first city in, in central Mexico, and it was huge, um, it fell about 550, 600 AD. And it was very clearly a class stratified city with ruling class and commoners. Uh, when that city falls, and it falls with you know, real drama, and they burn buildings and kill people and stuff like that, the ruling classes split off and they find other places to rule because that's their job. It's, you know, it's not something you get elected to, it's something you get born into. That that's your job is to rule. And that's the way it's been in Mesoamerica you know, from 2000 BC almost with the Olmec that you had nobles and commoners. And Ben Nelson noted that, that you can almost see a ripple effect coming out from the fall of Teotihuacan where these small polities pop up where previously there hadn't been you know, organized governments. And some, yeah, I think some vague echo, uh, a little wave of that kind of laps up against the Southwest from time to time. The tribes uh, who we consult with on these projects still have a very strong connection to these areas. So when you're talking about senses of landscape and place, uh, we wouldn't say that these areas have been abandoned. Uh, they still have a strong connection. So, so any actions we have under here or out here, uh, we make sure we consult on that. Uh, we've been working on building relationships with the, our tribal partners. In talking about uh, future recreation out here, uh, we see education being a component. Uh, talking with the uh, tribal consultants, uh, they are looking to provide input. So uh, the people visiting this reservoir uh, will know the history and how important it is uh, and, and what took place out here. It's you know basically a condition of the city uh, helping uh, manage this facility is to make sure that um, uh, cultural sensitivity training will be included. 
but you know, it, it, it is a special place. And, uh, and that's what we want to get across. So when you're out here, you know, be, be respectful of, of your actions. Obviously, um, by completing the Animus La Plata project, uh, we now have a, a reservoir uh, in Wizards Basin. Um, it changed the environment considerably. Um, we have to kind of put in perspective that the environment did change over time. We do uh, uh, change landscapes, um, but we make sure that we comply with all of the uh, applicable laws and regulations and that, that we take our impacts into, or those impacts into consideration and help manage um, uh, the lands in a uh, respectful manner. In a moment's time To turn away Leave it all behind So Wake up!